Hello students, this is uh, Professor McDermott. Well, we've reached the point in the course uh, when we'll uh, address the first of the two great wars of the 20th century, World War I. Of course, uh, at the time of World War I, nobody knew that there was going to be a World War II, uh, and so they simply called this war the Great War, because it was by far the greatest and most terrible war that had ever taken place in human history um, up to that point. Let's start by going through um, several factors uh, that led up to the outbreak of World War I. We'll explore these one by one. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, um, the Russians were members of the ethnic group known as the Slavs. And uh, other Slavs included uh, the Polish people, but especially uh, several um, different uh, groups of people in the Balkans region in southeastern Europe. Uh, most notably uh, the Serbians. Now, Russia thought it had a, a, a special role as the protector and the mentor of these um, Slavic peoples. And of course, that wasn't totally unselfish because, um, as I mentioned before, Russia had a lot to gain from getting involved uh, in the Balkans. But uh, the Russians did seem to have also a genuine feeling of responsibility as the protector of these Slavic peoples. Um, also on a religious basis because um, these Slavs in the Balkans, just like um, the Slavs in Russia, were Eastern Orthodox Christians. So they shared the same religious outlook. Um, and so that made them even more closely tied uh, to one another. But the other great powers of Europe were very made very nervous by uh, Russia's ambitions in the Balkans region. And so the two great powers of Central Europe, Germany and Austria-Hungary, got together in 1879 and formed an alliance, uh, the dual alliance, um, in which they basically promised to help each other in the event that either of them went to war with Russia. This alliance um, expanded into the Triple Alliance in 1882 when Italy uh, joined up. And so from that point forward, we refer to Germany, Austria, Hungary, um, especially as the central powers in Europe. Now, an al another alliance formed in Europe uh, as a reaction to the Triple Alliance. Other countries were made nervous by the Triple Alliance, and so uh, they allied themselves to each other as well. Uh, first, in 1894, France and Russia uh, agreed that if either country were attacked by any member of the Triple Alliance, that the other country would have to come to that country's aid. Uh, this is what we call a defensive alliance. Basically, they agreed to um, defend each other in case they were attacked by the Central Powers. The third uh, party to the Triple Entente, Great Britain, uh, was slower uh, to get on board. Uh, the British had always had pretty good relationships with um, Germany. Uh, they had cooperated, after all, uh, to defeat Napoleon, the Prussians, and the British, as, as you recall. Um, also, the Kaiser of Germany, the Emperor of Germany, Wilhelm II, was actually Queen Victoria's grandson. So there were even family relationships between the royals. But um, an event between 1899 and 1902 in South Africa really um, began the process of spoiling the German and British relationship, and that was called the Boer War. Um, basically, the British had some settlers in South Africa, and the Dutch had some settlers in South Africa who were called Afrikaners, and uh, those uh, settlers of those different groups were at each other's throats, and the British stepped in uh, trying to defeat the Afrikaners. But um, the Germans gave the Afrikaners quite a bit of support um, during the Boer War, and so that really irritated um, Great Britain and, and, and helped promote a split between Germany and Britain. Um, so that by 1904, uh, the British were ready to sign a secret agreement with France called the Entente Cordiale, that meant um, the, the friendly agreement, um, to support each other in the case in certain conditions if a war uh, broke out. 
Um, and these alliances were very, very important in leading up to World War I because when you engage yourself to an ally and you promise to support them, uh, it doesn't give you much room for maneuver or flexibility if a war does break out, um, unless you want to look like someone who doesn't keep a country that doesn't keep its promises. Another factor uh, that uh, helped to uh, create World War I was an arms race that took place between Germany and the British, um, especially with respect to um, ships and their navies. Um, and this began when Kaiser Wilhelm uh, read a book by an American uh, ship's captain named Alfred Mahan called The Influence of Sea Power on History. And basically, this was a very influential book. It came out in 1890. Um, and Mahan argued that any nation that wanted to be a great power had to have a great navy. And he gave numerous historical examples of how important naval power was to national survival. So this really struck a nerve with uh, Wilhelm. And from that point forward, uh, he became determined to build up uh, the German Navy. And uh, also he was under pressure from groups of German citizens who had formed organizations like the Pan-German League and the Naval League uh, during the 1890s uh, to promote uh, German naval buildup. However, the British um, couldn't have been more upset when Germany began to build up its navy because the British had the greatest navy in the world, and it was very important to them to maintain that dominance on the high seas because their enormous empire was, as you know, scattered all over the world, and it was the navy that really held it together. Uh, and unless the British felt that unless their navy was really the superpower at sea, that their empire would um, fall apart. And so the British responded uh, to the German naval buildup in 1906 by uh, launching the biggest, the fastest, uh, the most powerful warship ever built called His Majesty's Ship Dreadnought. Um, had more firepower uh, than any other ship in existence. Um, but as so often happens in arms races, Germany figured out how to make dreadnoughts. Um, and so uh, the whole situation escalated so that in between 1906 and 1914, both Britain and Germany kept uh, producing more and more ships of this dreadnought um, class in a kind of never ending spiral. So this really helped to increase the tension, especially between the British and the Germans. Um, then, of course, there, were, uh, there was the Balkans region itself, which is notoriously um, unstable uh, and was especially volatile during the years leading up to World War I. Um, I want to show, I'll come back to the slide, but I want to show you on the map, um, you see the Austro-Hungarian Empire there in the top left corner, and you see the region of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, with its capital city, um, Sarajevo, also near the top left. In 1908, Austria-Hungary announced that it was annexing Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, and uh, the Serbians next door to them were really very upset because the Serbians also had uh, designs on Bosnia and the Austrians beat them um, to it. So, um, the Serbs mobilized their army. Uh, that means that they basically deployed it to the borders of their country um, and prepared for war. Uh, but at the last minute, um, there was a negotiated agreement. And so the Austria-Hungary and the Serbs didn't actually go to war in 1908. But um, many Serbians were, um, it, continued to be extremely upset about this, and groups began to form within Serbia with very sinister names like the Black Hand. Um, nationalist Serbian groups, the goal of which was to destabilize the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire, to do whatever they could to undermine Austria-Hungary. Um, in 1912, 
uh, Serbia led the way in a revolt against uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and again, we'll come back. But here's, if you see here on the map, all of that territory with the red diagonal lines uh, belonged to the Ottomans up to 1912. But uh, Serbia, uh, with the cooperation of other ethnic groups in the Balkans, was able to defeat the Ottomans in 1912 um, so that the Ottomans lost all that territory. Then there was another war in 1913 fought among the Balkan countries to figure out who would get what bits of territory. But you can see on the map that Serbia really came out of these Balkan wars about twice as large as it had been before. And it came out very cocky, <laughs> very sure of itself, and really spoiling for a fight against um, Austria-Hungary. And with the Ottoman Empire now basically driven out of Europe and out of the picture, people began to speculate, uh, was Austria-Hungary now the sick man of Europe. Was that going to be the next big empire to collapse and disappear from uh, the European map? Another uh, factor that often increased tension between the great powers had to do with um, their colonial empires. So the Germans, the French, the British, all were trying to build up colonial empires. Uh, and they often would come into conflict um, in Africa or in Asia as they tried to expand uh, their empires. Um, one factor in that, that really tended to increase the damage of these imperial crises was um, the fact that Kaiser Wilhelm always seemed to have the gift of saying the wrong thing <laughs> at the wrong time. Uh, here's one quote from him. He said, quote, I believe as it is written in the Bible that it is my duty to increase the German heritage Whoever tries to interfere with my task, I shall crush. Um, so those really sounded like fighting words and really ratcheted up the hostility uh, between Germany and the other powers of the Entente. Um, a lot of the imperial problems centered on the North African country of Morocco. In 1905, um, France and Germany nearly went to war over Morocco. Both countries claimed Morocco as, as a colony. Um, this first Moroccan crisis was important because it was the first time that the French and British ever got together and made concrete military plans as to what they would do if they both went to war against um, Germany. Um, the second Moroccan crisis of 1911 um, basically, the French annexed Morocco finally and said it was part of their empire. Uh, it was a protectorate. That meant they were protecting it. And in retaliation, the Germans sent um, an armed warship to Agadir, Morocco, uh, to challenge the French. And once again, uh, war was only narrowly avoided <clears throat> by negotiations in 1911. But um, this crisis really left a bad taste in the mouth of uh, many people on, on both sides. And the British edged closer uh, and deeper into their alliance with France as a result. Uh, one British cab cabinet minister, David Lloyd George, said these words at the time, quote, The formula of peace at any price is unworthy of a great power, end quote. What's he saying there? Basically, you know... England is willing to meet Germany halfway, but we're not willing to have peace at any price. Um, you know, uh, we're not going to give up everything to the Germans, and there may come a time uh, when we have to fight back, when we have to, to draw a line uh, against Germany and go to war with her. Um, Yet another factor uh, that really influenced the outbreak of World War I had to do with the military plans of both sides, especially Germany and France. Um, now, of course, Germany was in the center of Europe. It had France on one side and it had France's ally Russia on the other side. And the Germans were really afraid of this feeling. They had this feeling of encirclement, being encircled by their enemies. And they were really afraid of fighting a war on two fronts against France and Russia. They didn't think they could win. Um, however, <clears throat> a German general named um, von Schlieffen came up with a plan that would eliminate that possibility if it was executed properly. Schlieffen's plan 
provided for Germany to knock France out of the war within the first couple of weeks. Um, how would they do that? Well, they'd have to invade through um, Belgium. Uh, that would be controversial because Belgium was a neutral country when it was created in 1838, all the great powers of Europe, including Britain and Prussia, had signed a treaty saying they would respect the Belgians' neutrality. So essentially the Germans would have to commit a war crime in order to invade France this way, but they were willing to do that if it meant they could avoid a war on two fronts. So uh, basically the key was to knock France out quickly, deliver a knockout blow, and then, once that had happened, they could send all those troops from the Western Front to Russia and then deal with Russia. Um, so it was really a, a, a very clever plan, but everything depended on the timing. And that sense that time was running out, that the clock was ticking um, before they had to execute the Schlieffen plan, really would influence Germany's decision to declare war uh, in World War I. Um, the French also had a very offensive-minded plan. Uh, there was a, a concept in the French language, élan, that meant zest or zeal for life. And um, the French generals were every bit as aggressive and offensively minded as the German generals. But um, their plan was to invade the German heartland through the provinces of Alsace-Lorraine. You may recall that these were two little bits of France that had been taken by Germany uh, after the Franco-Prussian War, the French really resented that, wanted those territories back. So they were going to invade through Alsace-Lorraine and then thrust deeply into the German heartland and in the war uh, that way. Now, you may ask, why didn't the French take any precautions as far as defending the Belgian border? Uh, you know, they must have known there was a chance that the Germans would attack through Belgium. Well, the French didn't believe that was going to happen. Why? Because they knew that the British would never tolerate a violation of Belgian neutrality. And they knew that if the Germans attacked through Belgium, that would bring the British into the war on the Entente side against Germany. And they didn't think the Germans would risk that. And so they didn't even bother to fortify the Belgian border. Instead, they just focused in their Plan 17 on striking into Germany. So this, these were two totally asymmetrical uh, plans, and we'll see how this played out in the opening days of August 1914. Uh, and as you may know, uh, the spark that really set all the wheels in motion and touched off the Great War was the assassin assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Um, he was the heir to Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary. He was next in line for the throne. Um, and he and his wife, the Duchess Sophie, uh, visited Sarajevo in Bosnia on June 28, 1914. And Serb nationalists, by which you can read Serb terrorists, because <laughs> that's really what they were, were out in force trying to assassinate Archduke Franz Ferdinand. One guy threw a bomb at their car uh, and they, uh, but it didn't explode, and so uh, the car then veered into a side street where a young Serbian nationalist named Gavrilo Princip was waiting with a revolver, and uh, he killed both Fer Franz Ferdinand and Sophie um, with his pistol. Now, after this incident, nothing happened for almost four weeks. The Austrians didn't do anything, but finally, after the world had almost forgotten about the incident, uh, finally on July 23, 1914, the Austrians delivered an ultimatum to Serbia. What is an ultimatum? Well, it's basically a message saying, you're going to do this or else. <laughs> you may have had to deliver an ultimatum to your boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband <laughs> at some point. Um, but uh, the Austrian ultimatum to Serbia had several demands. Uh, one was that the Serbians censor their public newspapers so that um, they were not allowed to attack Austria-Hungary. Second, that all of the Serbian nationalist groups would be uh, suppressed and eliminated. Third, that any public officials who were sympathetic with those groups would be fired. And fourth, that an investigation would be held into uh, the assassination and other uh, activities committed by these groups. Uh, 
and that Austrian citizens would have to be part of those um, investigations and that they would have to sit on any courts um, that put anyone on trial. Um, now, those were stiff uh, demands that the Austrians were making and interestingly enough the Serbians actually accepted all the demands except for one. They said we're not going to allow Austrian people to sit on our courts and take part in our justice system. The Serbs felt that uh, if they did that they would be no longer an independent country. Um, and so they said yes to every one of the demands except for that one uh, and waited to see what would happen. Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, the Austrians did not accept uh, the Serbian response, and so matters inched uh, towards war, um, actually moved ahead towards war quite quickly because, again, each power had its own military plans and uh, they had to be executed within a certain period of time. And so that actually drove a lot of the sequence of events in the outbreak of the war. Uh, I don't expect you to remember all this, but just to give you a sense of how it happened, um, when the Serbs sent their response to the ultimatum, they mobilized their troops on the same day, July 25th, and in solidarity with Serbia, uh, the Russians, anticipating a negative response by Austria, put their own troops on alert. Well, uh, on July 28th, uh, the Austrians announced they were not accepting Serbia's uh, statement that they were declaring war on Serbia. Um, now, at this point, the war could have stayed limited and, and very localized in the Balkans region. It could have just been a war between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. Um, but really, I think the key factor in transforming this into a global war was the decisions by the the decision by the Russians to mobilize their troops in support of Serbia on July thirty um, first. Now the Russians knew they they have a vast, huge country, and they knew it would take a long time for them to mobilize. Uh, so that's one reason why they rushed ahead and did that. But in a way, that forced the Germans' hand, because the Germans assumed if the Russians were in the war, the French would also get into the war, and that meant if they were going to avoid that two-front war, they had to attack France and they had to do it quickly. And so that is why on August 1st, the Germans uh, made the war inevitable by uh, declaring war on Russia and mobilizing all their troops. Um, and of course the French mobilized on the same day against Germany. Um, then two days later the Germans launched their invasion of Belgium, um, declared war on France, and Europe was at war. But there was still a big question mark, would the British get involved on the side of France uh, and Russia? Uh, Parliament met um, or uh, from the night of August 3rd all night um, into the morning of August 4th and finally um, the British did announce that um, they could not um, accept the violation of Belgian neutrality by Germany and they did declare war on Germany um, as well. So that was the initial lineup uh, in uh, World War I, Germany and, Germany and Austria-Hungary uh, on one side, um, Serbia, Russia, France, and the British on the other side. Italy <laughs> really um, uh, betrayed their partners in the Triple Alliance because uh, they did not join the war at first, and then eventually they actually got into the war on the other side because the Entente powers offered them more territory uh, at the end of the war if they would join up, and so, so they really uh, kind of ratted out their own allies. But as a sort of consolation prize, the Ottoman Empire did uh, actually join the war on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Now, of course, at the beginning of any war, <laughs> people are always overly optimistic and they think it'll be over in a matter of weeks. Um, in this case, most people in Europe thought that a, a really lengthy war was unlikely. Uh, 
because they believed that big business interests in Europe would get together and convince the national government leaders uh, to stop the war so they could go back to business as usual. And so influenced by this kind of optimism, the Kaiser at one point told the troops on their way to the front, quote, you will be home before the leaves have fallen from the trees, end quote. Uh, and most people expected the war to be over by Christmas uh, 1914 at the latest. Only one of the great statesmen um, really anticipated and saw what, what this war was going to be like, and that was the British Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey. Um, he was looking out the window that evening of August the 3rd, and he was watching a lamplighter um, light, lighting gas lamps. You know, in those days they had to uh, light these by hand. Uh, they were, uh, the energy source was gas, and so they had to light them by hand. So he's watching this going on, looking out the window, and he made this comment. The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. So that was the shape of things to come. Um, now, General von Schlieffen had died in January 1913, and as he lay on his deathbed, he choked out his last dying words, which were, keep the right wing strong. In other words, um, you, this drive into France has to be a real knockout blow, um, and you cannot weaken the invasion force by diverting soldiers to any other place. You have to put everything you've got into this knockout punch against France. However, uh, when the German high command began executing the Schlieffen plan, as they drove into France, it became necessary for them to send some troops to other places. For example, the French also launched Plan 17, so they're driving into Germany, and so they had to send some German troops to try to defend the German homeland. Also, the Russians really did a much better job of mobilizing than anybody thought they could, and they got uh, to the front much faster than anybody expected. And so uh, Germany had to send some troops to defend against the Russian army as well. And so their offensive was weakened just enough that the French and the British were able to stop the German advance at the Marne River um, just before the Germans reached Paris. With the help of a number of French soldiers who were rushed to the battlefield by uh, taxi drivers from, from Paris in kind of a famous incident. Um, so when the uh, Entente stopped the German advance, the next phase was what was called the race to the sea. Both sides um, hightailed it towards the North Sea to the northwest, trying to get there first so that they could outflank the other side. But as it happened, they both arrived um, at the same time. And so both sides on the Western Front dug trenches and sat down in those trenches and basically stayed where they were uh, for the next uh, four years. Um, there was more movement on the Eastern Front between Russia, Germany, and Austria-Hungary, uh, more mobility, gains, and losses of territory. But on the Western Front, there was a real uh, stalemate. Now, why was that? Uh, if you remember from a previous lecture on the Crimean War, I mentioned that the widespread use of rifles in that war and in the U.S. Civil War uh, had shown that with rifles, um, a defender could easily, more easily stop an attack. It became much more difficult for anyone to mount um, an attack, and the advantage in warfare really went to the defensive side. Um, and that was especially true in World War I. If you think about some of the other weapons that had been invented um, since the Civil, U.S. Civil War, for example, machine guns. If you can stop an attack with a rifle, how much more effectively can you stop an attack with a machine gun? Um, there were other new weapons that were deployed for the first time in this war. Uh, aircraft, um, primitive airplanes, uh, of course, were used in this war, uh, but actually uh, they were only used for surveillance normally. Um, the main military force in the air were actually dirigibles, which were large hot air balloons like the Goodyear blimp. Um, that's a dirigible. Um, and so 
Uh, but both were used during World War I. Um, soldiers had hand grenades in World War I. They also used flamethrowers for the first time. Uh, even the first tanks were used towards the end of the war. Kind of primitive. They, they didn't have much impact on the war, but they did make an appearance. Submarines, however, were used extensively during this war, especially by uh, the Germans. We'll talk more about that in a little while. Um, finally, chemical weapons uh, like sarin gas, nerve gas, and mustard gas, so forth, um, have been banned by international treaty um, now for several decades uh, throughout the world, but they were used extensively by all um, the powers in World War One, and um, that had some devastating consequences for World War One soldiers. They often had to wear gas masks to protect themselves from um, gas attack, um, but um, the uh, poison gas would often blind people, especially, uh, and it was very terrifying. Um, here's some pictures from World War One. Um, you see some aircraft in action. Uh, they did sometimes fight each other in what were called dogfights, and you may have heard of the famous Red Baron, um, Baron Manfred von Richthofen, the German flying ace, uh, who Snoopy in the Peanuts comic strip was always trying to imitate. Uh, he was the most famous fighter pilot of um, World War I. Uh, there you see uh, two observation balloons uh, being shot down in February 1918. You see an early tank at the top left, and you see a gas attack um, and the aftermath of a gas attack, a number of British soldiers uh, who have been blinded in April of 1918. Um, now, life in the trenches was horrific <laughs> in a lot of ways. There's no way to put a good face on this. Um, soldiers suffered from trench mouth and trench foot um, diseases. Um, where their bodies would essentially decay from being exposed to rain and, and, and mud uh, continuously and, and not being sheltered properly. Um, in between the two lines of trenches um, was a region called uh, No Man's Land, and No Man's Land was covered with um, barbed wire. Uh, it was very muddy. Uh, it was filled with dead horses, dead people. Um, lots and lots of rats eating the corpses, horrific smells, unexploded artillery shells, and uh, the heavy, heavy use of artillery in this war um, had the result that many soldiers got what was called shell shock, what we would call today PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder was really first observed in uh, World War I where it was called shell shock. People would literally, uh, I mean, they ter suffer terrible trauma just from the constant sound um, of the artillery uh, barrages. So every now and then, one side or the other would decide to attack the other side's trenches. And so they would send their boys over the top into um, no man's land. And invariably, when this would happen, um, the other side would sit calmly in their trenches and just mow down the attackers with their machine guns, with their hand grenades, with their rifles, um, and the attack would fail and, and, and uh, there would be enormous, enormous um, casualties. Um, so just one example uh, I want to give you. Uh, in 1916, near the Somme River, the British decided to mount a huge offensive um, against the Germans. And so on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, they sent 110,000 young men over the top. Uh, out of those 110,000, 60,000 were killed or wounded. 19,000 were killed. Now, that was just in one day. And that was just on one side, the British side. Uh, 19,000 in one day. To put that in perspective, uh, we've been fighting a war in Afghanistan for 15 years as of the time I'm, I'm recording this and for 13 years in Iraq. And you know how many U.S. soldiers have died in Iraq and Afghanistan in all that time? About 7,000. 7,000. Um, 
in more than 13 years. Now, I, I'm not taking anything away from their heroism or their sacrifice, but I'm just trying to put this into perspective and show you what a really horrible bloody war World War I uh, was. More than twice as many killed in one day at the sum as have been killed in those two wars going on for uh, 13 and 15 years. Well, as I said, uh, at the beginning of the war there was a lot of optimism, there was tremendous patriotism and enthusiasm, and of course the newspapers, um, just as they had whipped up the frenzy for imperialism, helped to whip up this war fever among all the great um, powers. And of course uh, the media put the you know, the most rosy possible spin on life at the front. Uh, here's one British newspaper report uh, on life in the trenches. Quote, health is so good, an indigestion hardly ever heard of, the open air life, the regular and plenteous feeding, the exercise, and the freedom from care and responsibility keep the soldiers extraordinarily fit and contented. End quote. Well, of course, that bore very little resemblance to life on the Western Front in World War I, and the truth did slowly begin to come out as wounded soldiers especially uh, were discharged and returned home and, and talked about their experiences. Um, basically people realized uh, the other side of the story, and as the war went on, um, especially in Russia, soldiers became very mutinous. Um, sometimes refused to obey uh, orders from their from their superiors and there was a lot of despair but for the British this despair was captured by a group of poets from the Western Front who began to publish works about the war and uh, one of the most famous of them was um, a man named Wilfred Owen who was fighting on the Western Front um, and uh, his most famous poem is called Dulce et Decorum Est, and I'm going to read it to you. Um, in order to understand this poem, you need to know the phrase at the top of your screen there. Uh, Dulce et Decorum Est pro Patria Mori. This was written by the Roman po poet Horace. It was drilled into British schoolboys who were supposed to go serve the empire uh, cheerfully. Uh, what it means is, it is sweet and fitting to die for the fatherland. It is sweet and fitting to die uh, for the fatherland. So keep that in mind as you hear uh, this poem. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind. Drunk with fatigue. Deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas? Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, bitten as the cud of vile and curable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Wow. Um, you know, nobody had ever said anything like that before in the British Empire. Nobody had ever questioned the rulers of the British Empire when they sent their sons to die uh, abroad, or very few had. Um, but that mood of defiance, that mood of despair uh, and depression would, and skepticism, 
would mark the entire period between um, the wars. And it, it really begins with these um, writers telling the truth about life on the Western Front in World War I. Um, conditions were so bad uh, in Russia as of February 1917, the Tsar, the Emperor of Russia, Nicholas II, had taken over personal command of the army, but the soldiers were very mutinous, very rebellious, um, and the whole military effort was falling apart. Uh, there was a lot of starvation, hunger, um, shortages at home. Um, the situation was getting ugly, and a man named Alexander Kerensky took advantage of it to launch a revolution in February 1917 um, and persuaded the Tsar to abdicate his throne, to step down, uh, so that Kerensky could form a new um, government, which he wanted to be more or less on an American model, constitutional government. However, the Germans uh, did something very clever at this point. They knew that there was a Russian communist leader named V.I. Lenin uh, who was in exile in Switzerland. The Russians had uh, sent him there to get rid of him. Um, the Germans approached Lenin and said, um, we're going to give you free passage across Germany uh, if you will re-enter Russia and start preaching a communist revolution there. And that is exactly what Lenin did. Um, he came into Russia at the Finland station in St. Petersburg, got off the train, and immediately began calling for a communist revolution by a group called the Bolshevik Party. Um, now, this was a very small group, but um, they struck at just the right moment in November 1917. Uh, that's by our calendar, New Style calendar. Uh, but sometimes you'll hear this called the October Revolution because, according to the Russian calendar, it took place um, in October. They hadn't modernized their calendar yet. Uh, but in any case, the Bolsheviks um, seized power and established a communist dictatorship um, that would last until uh, 1991 in, um, in Russia. And uh, Lenin repaid his uh, German friends who had sent him into Russia on March 3rd, 1918, when uh, Russia signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which uh, basically, in which basically the Russians surrendered and uh, left uh, the war effort. Now, obviously, that would free up a great many troops um, for uh, the Western Front and would give Germany a chance to strike a crushing blow uh, on the Western Front. However, Fortunately for France and Britain, by this point in time, the United States had gotten into the war. How did that happen? Um, well, I mentioned the German submarines, which were called U-boats, um, and uh, Germany used these very, very effectively to take out shipping by the Entente um, powers on the high seas. Um, and so they would, they would sink even passenger ships. Um, if they thought that there were military personnel or, or weapons on the ship. Um, they didn't sink United States ships at the opening of the war. However, many American citizens traveled overseas on British cruise liners, um, like the Lusitania. And uh, on May 7th, 1915, the Lusitania was sunk, torpedoed by a German U-boat. Uh, because the U-boat commander suspected correctly that it had weapons on board bound for the Western Front. So by the laws of war, he was justified in sinking the Lusitania, but there were 128 U.S. citizens on board, and um, the U.S. public was outraged that Germans were killing innocent American um, civilians on the high seas. So the President of the United States, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, went to the Germans, and um, negotiated an agreement with them that from then on, the Germans, when they were about to sink a passenger ship, would surface their submarine. The captain would have to get out with a megaphone and yell, we're about to sink your ship, man the lifeboats. <laughs> now, this was a very big concession for the Germans to make. This was very generous of them because it, it put their submarines in danger, really, uh, to do this. But they stuck to this new policy until February 1917. 
Uh, by then, Germany was so desperate to have any kind of edge that might win the war that in that month they announced that they were going to go back to their old policy of just sinking passenger ships without uh, warning. And uh, a little later, British intelligence intercepted a telegram which they said was from the German Foreign Minister Alfred von Zimmermann to the government of Mexico. And in this telegram, Zimmermann said um, that if the United States got into the war, um, Germany would support Mexico in any attack Mexico made on the U.S. and would support them in trying to get back California, Arizona, New Mexico, all this, the areas we had taken from them in 1848 after the Mexican War. Um, well, the British spies gave this telegram to Wilson. Wilson notified the press, and American public opinion was thrown into a frenzy of war fever uh, because of the Zimmerman telegram, so that in April 1917, Wilson announced to Congress that we were at war um, with uh, Germany. But it took a long time for our military to be prepared for uh, to enter uh, the war. Um, fortunately, we came in just at the right time. March 21st, 1918, uh, all those troops transferred from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. Um, the Germans launched a huge attack all along the Western Front, 1.6 million troops on this offensive. And for the first time during the war, they were able to make steady progress and uh, gained uh, up to 40 miles in some places um, and captured a lot of territory, getting close enough to Paris that they could actually bombard Paris with their new super weapon, the Big Bertha gun, which could fire artillery shells up to 24 miles in the air, <clears throat> believe it or not. Um, but Americans uh, were, were there fighting alongside the British and French, and the Americans did play an important role in the counterattack in July 1918, um, which pushed back uh, the German advance uh, to the red line that you see on the map there. And you see on the, the map the names of some, uh, some of the battles that Americans were involved in in 1918, Bella Wood, Shadow Thierry, Sammy Helm. Um, so that even though we didn't play a huge role in this war, I think there was a huge psychological advantage um, that the Germans knew that the Americans, the United States, had almost unlimited resources, almost an unlimited supply of men. And, um, and I, I think that demoralized Germany um, so that when the attack, when their offensive began to falter, a lot of unrest broke out in Germany. Uh, it looked like for a while there was going to be a communist re revolution in Germany or a socialist revolution. Um, and so uh, finally, um, the German government uh, decided to sign a truce with uh, the Entente powers. And this took place on uh, November the 11th, uh, 1918, um, which became known as Armistice Day. Um, actually, there is an American holiday uh, based on this Veterans Day. Originally, it was Armistice Day. We don't celebrate this to the extent the British do. I happened to be in England one year on Armistice Day. And it was very touching, you know, all the people that day wear poppies, red, blood red flowers in their lapels, uh, because they still remember a hundred years later, they still remember all of the people that died um, in that war. One of them was Wilfred Owen. Um, it was rather tragic. As the bells were ringing out in his home village for the armistice to celebrate the victory, uh, his mother got a telegram uh, saying that Wilfred Owen had just been killed. Um, on the Western Front. Um, so he didn't survive the war um, and uh, of course there were millions and millions of young men who didn't survive the war. 1.7 million in Russia, even more than that in Germany. 1.2 million in Austria-Hungary which did collapse and did disappear from the map at the end of the war. Uh, 1.35 million in France, almost a million in Britain. Um, you see that really a whole generation of young men was wiped out uh, in the war in Europe. Uh, the U.S. didn't suffer as much because of our late arrival, uh, 
Um, but President Wilson, as we'll see in the next lecture, did play a huge role in the negotiations that led to the Treaty of Versailles that finally ended the war. Uh, but in this module, we're going to go ahead and read some documents uh, pertaining to Wilson's project of starting a League of Nations. Um, Wilson really wanted uh, to create an organization. It was kind of like our modern United Nations, but this was an international organization, representatives from every country in the world, um, that wanted to join uh, with the hopes of establishing world peace um, forever. And um, Wilson pioneered this. Uh, he really wanted the United States to join the League of Nations, but according to our Constitution, our Senate, the United States Senate, has to approve any treaties made by the President. And so the Senate had to decide, and one of the Senators, Bora, um, made a very famous speech against the League of Nations. And so for your documents this time, you're going to have a statement by Wilson supporting the League, a statement by Bora against the League, and then you're going to debate the issue among yourselves and take a vote in each group whether you thought the United States in 1919 should have joined the League of Nations or not. Um, and uh, I won't reveal yet what the United States actually did because uh, I don't want to prejudice your discussion. But I am looking forward very much to the results of that, um, of that discussion in Module 7.